Welcome to the IB Biology Interactive Lecture on Sections 2.6 and 2.7, which cover DNA, RNA, and the central dogma of biology and genetics. Like all other macromolecules, DNA and RNA are very unique. Both of these molecules, along with other molecules like ATP, fall under the nucleic acid macromolecule category. And as we stated before, nucleic acids are made out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and are generally used as carrier molecules, carrying things like energy and genetic information. Now the focus of this video is on DNA and RNA, and these molecules hold all of the genetic information within our cells that are used and also passed to the next generation of offspring. DNA and RNA are made out of smaller monomer structures called nucleotides. And when these nucleotides come together, the very long strands of DNA and shorter strands of RNA are created. The basic structure of this building block called a nucleotide has a few components. The middle component is a sugar molecule, and attached to that is a phosphate group and also a nitrogen base, sometimes referred to as a nucleobase. The general structure can be drawn in many different ways, but I think the most common representation that students often draw for the IB exam is like this. The pentagon represents the sugar, a rectangle representing the base, and a circle representing the phosphate. Nucleotides that make up DNA and RNA are connected together by covalent bonds that link the phosphate group of one nucleotide to the sugar of another. When many nucleotides are put together, the sugar and the phosphate group create the backbone of the DNA or RNA molecule. Additionally, in DNA molecules, two bases on either side of the strand are linked together via hydrogen bonds, and the number of hydrogen bonds depends on the type of base used. You can see here that there are five different nitrogenous bases used to build DNA and RNA, each with their own name and unique structure. We'll talk about these more in later slides. Now that we know about the base structures that build nucleic acids, let's focus in on the big polymer. DNA. DNA is a large molecule that is made up of billions of nucleotides. The shape of DNA is a helix, which is basically a long spiral, and it has two strands that make up its structure, which is why we refer to it as a double helix. Each strand spirals around the other in parallel so the backbones of the helices never touch. But parallel doesn't do the best job of describing the orientation of the strands because the two strands of DNA are pointed in different directions. We can describe the orientation using the carbon molecules within each sugar that makes up the backbone. Each sugar has five carbons, and if you count them clockwise, you can number them like this. Now on the left DNA strand, you can see that the fifth carbon is pointing up and the third carbon is pointing down. And on the opposing strand, the fifth carbon is pointing down and the third carbon is pointing up because the strands are inverted. We call these the five prime and three prime ends, which will be important when we talk about DNA replication later on in this video. This is also why the term anti-parallel is a better descriptor for DNA. Two parallel strands that never touch facing opposite directions. On the last slide, we talked about the structure of a nucleotide, and each strand of DNA is a long chain of nucleotides linked together, which are connected by covalent bonds between the sugar and phosphate groups. But to make a DNA molecule, the two spiral strands need to be connected to each other, and this is done with those hydrogen bonds we discussed. Now the base pairs that are connected at these hydrogen bonds follow a pattern. And for DNA, the pattern is that the adenine nitrogen base always bonds with the thymine base, and guanine always pairs with cytosine. A pairs with T, C pairs with G. This rule is called complementary base pairing, and if it is done correctly, the DNA bases will always be paired in this pattern. Between these bases are hydrogen bonds, and it's important to know that adenine and thymine are connected with two hydrogen bonds, whereas cytosine and guanine are connected by three hydrogen bonds. These are all general rules of complementary base pairs. It seems pretty commonplace today to understand the structure of DNA, but not too long ago, scientists were still unraveling this mystery. Two scientists, James Watson and Francis Crick, used modeling and a lot of trial and error to propose a structure that correctly resembled a three-dimensional structure 
of DNA. This took time and many failures as some of their early models included an altered sugar phosphate backbone, a triple helix, and nitrogen bases that did not follow the complementary rule, which of course was not known at the time. They got to a point where the structure was just about there, but one aspect was missing, and it wasn't until Rosalind Franklin used X-ray crystallography to show that the strands seemed to be crossing over each other, which implied that the two strands were arranged in a helix which of course we know now as the double helix. Originally, Franklin's data was shared without her knowledge or permission, which led to the full credit of the discovery at the time belonging to Watson and Crick. Today, we know and teach that the three of these scientists contributed to the discovery of the structure. Now, all of this talk about DNA is great, but there is another important nucleic acid that shares many similar properties to DNA, and that is RNA. We talked about these two molecules at the beginning of the video, but there are a few important points that we need to add and also hammer down about the similarities and differences of the two, which will likely show up on the IB exam. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and the deoxyribo part of the name is in reference to the sugar molecule that makes up the backbone. The sugar is called ribose, and because the ribose sugars found within DNA have one less oxygen branching from the second carbon, it is referred to as deoxyribonucleic, ribose with one less oxygen. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid, which, as you can guess, the ribose sugar here has that oxygen that the DNA sugar is missing. So we simply call it ribonucleic. Next, when comparing DNA and RNA, a larger difference is that DNA is made up of two strands where RNA is a single strand. Being a single strand gives RNA more flexibility for the many functions it has, which we will discuss later. Lastly, the base pairs that make up DNA and RNA are slightly different. They share the same cytosine, guanine, and adenine bases, but the fourth base used by each molecule differs. DNA uses thymine, while RNA uses uracil instead of thymine. So to abbreviate the bases used, DNA contains a TGC, and RNA contains a UGC. We'll talk about the significance of these bases later on in the video. DNA is a molecule that holds our genetic information, and to ensure that copies of our DNA exist within all of the trillions of cells that make up our body, and are also found in the cells we use to reproduce, DNA has a method of copying itself. This process is called DNA replication. We know from earlier in the video that DNA is a double-stranded molecule, with base pairs connecting the hydrogen bonds in the middle. In order for the process of DNA replication to begin, the two strands of DNA must be separated at those hydrogen bonds. This separation is performed by the enzyme helicase. It moves across the strand, separating the bases and unwinding the DNA. Now, with the bases on each strand freely exposed, another enzyme called DNA polymerase begins to add complementary bases to the open strands, which are acting as a template for the new strand to be built. For every adenine base on the old strand, the DNA polymerase pulls in a thymine to pair with it, and it does the same for guanine and cytosine matching. The rule of complementary bases is followed here to ensure that the two strands of DNA end up being identical. The nucleotides that get added to each strand are always added in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction of the new strand. This means, based on the orientation of the picture, that the new red strand will be added with the DNA polymerase moving to the right, because the top blue strand is oriented from 3' prime to 5'. Prime. So the new red strand will be added from 5' prime to 3' prime going in the opposite direction. Because of this orientation, and the DNA continuously being unzipped by the helicase, there are parts where new pieces of DNA are added continuously, and other parts where they are added in fragments. If the 5' prime to 3' prime end moves towards the direction of the DNA being unzipped by the helicase, the process of adding the bases is continuous. As the DNA unzips, the same polymerase molecule can just keep moving in that direction, adding the new nucleotides. But at the same position on the other original strand, the DNA cannot be added continuously 
because it is being unzipped in an opposite direction that the polymerase has to add the bases. In this scenario, the new DNA bases are added in fragments and later connected into one seamless piece. These fragments are called Okazaki fragments, named after the married couple who discovered them, Riji and Suneko Okazaki. The process of DNA replication is said to be a semi-conservative process. This means that in the process of creating a new DNA strand from an old existing strand, the old strand and new strand make up an equal percentage of each new DNA molecule when the replication process is done, which is 50% original strand and 50% newly synthesized strand. You can see in this image here that the original strand is illustrated in blue. During replication, which we just discussed on the last slide, the template, or old, strand gets split by helicase and then the DNA polymerase adds on the complementary bases to each of the split sides of the original strand. So when the process is done, the DNA is replicated, which means we went from one strand to two strands, and each new strand contains half of the original blue template and half of the newly synthesized red bases. Semi-conservative, as it only conserves half of the original strand within the new copy. With all of the knowledge we have about the structure of DNA, humans have built some pretty cool technology to be able to use this molecular information to help solve problems. And one important machine and technique that was built on the foundation of understanding DNA is the PCR machine. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, which describes a process of how DNA strands can be replicated very quickly using the specifically designed PCR machine. Now, why would you want to replicate a DNA strand to have over a million copies of it in a lab? Great question. PCR is used for many things, one example being in the field of forensic science. Let's say that you have a small sample of DNA from a crime scene extracted from a hair follicle. You want to analyze this DNA sequence and compare it to the DNA of other suspects, and in order to do that, you need more copies of it. With the PCR process, the forensic scientist can make millions of copies of one specific section of the DNA from the hair follicle, and do the same for the suspects and run an analysis to compare the two to see if they match. This process of running a polymerase chain reaction involves three steps, which are denaturing, annealing, and extending. This, in a sense, copies the process of DNA replication, because after all, the point is to replicate these strands. First, the DNA strand, primers, free-floating nucleotides, and an enzyme called TAC polymerase are added to the thermal cycler, which is the PCR machine. During the denaturation phase, the sample is heated up to around 90 degrees Celsius, which will separate the hydrogen bonds that hold the two backbones of the DNA strand together. Next, for the annealing phase, the sample is cooled down to around 55 degrees Celsius, which allows the primers to connect to the DNA sample at the specified location. Then, for elongation, the last phase, the sample is heated to 75 degrees Celsius, which allows the TAC polymerase to attach to the primer and then move along the strand attaching the free-floating nucleotides. When this process is over, the one original DNA strand now has two copies. The machine then goes through another round of heating and cooling, turning these two copies into four, and then again into eight, and 16, and so on exponentially. This is how, in just a matter of hours, you can go from one copy of a DNA strand to millions. In this video, we learned about DNA and RNA, and in a few past videos, we learned about proteins. What we are going to do now and over the next few slides is talk about an extremely important concept within molecular biology that links DNA, RNA, and proteins together. This concept is called the central dogma. The term dogma describes a specific set of principles, and the term central in this case refers to the idea of these principles being a core component of knowledge needed to understand many other applications of biology. So needless to say, this is a pretty big deal. Now in simple terms, the central dogma of molecular biology is laid out in front of us in this image. It starts with DNA. And if DNA is present, it has a template to create an RNA strand. And if RNA is present, it has the instructions to create a protein. If we describe this going backwards from the end to the beginning, we can say that proteins are made by the instructions provided by RNA, and RNA is made by a template provided by DNA. So if you change the DNA sequence, it will change the RNA sequence 
which could then change the protein. Obviously the process is more complicated than what this image shows, and each process here has a specific name that we're going to talk about in detail. The process of creating RNA from a DNA template is known as transcription, and the process of creating a protein from the RNA instructions is called translation. Let's break these down in detail. During the process of transcription, the DNA molecule is used as a template to create a strand of messenger RNA. This is important because DNA has the instructions to build the protein, but it cannot leave the nucleus of the cell. So instead, it copies the message into a messenger RNA strand, which has the ability to leave the nucleus and connect to a ribosome to build a protein. To accomplish this goal, the DNA is unzipped at a specific gene or desired location that needs to be copied with an enzyme called RNA polymerase. This enzyme separates the strand and moves along the DNA strand pulling in complementary bases in order to build the messenger RNA molecule. Remember that RNA is single-stranded and contains the bases A, U, G, C. So for every A on the DNA strand, the RNA polymerase will pull in a U. And for every T on the DNA strand, it will pull in an A. C and G match normally. When the strand is finished being created, it will detach from the DNA molecule. The DNA zips back up to its double helix, and the new messenger RNA molecule can now leave the nucleus, carrying the instructions of the DNA. The process of transcription is complete. Now starts the process of translation, where the messenger RNA molecule will attach to a ribosome structure to build a protein. This process starts with the ribosome binding to the messenger RNA strand that is free-floating within the cytoplasm. Each ribosome is made out of two subunits, the large and the small, and when attached it reads the messenger RNA sequence from the 5' prime to the 3' prime direction. The RNA strand is read by the ribosome base by base until a unique group of three bases is reached, with the base pairs A, U, G. This group of three bases, called a codon, signals for the process of translation to begin. And from the beginning point that starts with A, U, G, the ribosome will read the rest of the strand in groups of three, or in codons, until the process of translation is signaled to end. When each codon is interpreted by the ribosome as signals for a specific amino acid to be brought into the large subunit of the ribosome, a different RNA molecule, called tRNA, carries each amino acid in and makes sure the sequence matches up by having an anticodon of three bases match using the complementary base rules. If the sequence is a match, it drops off the amino acid that is used to build the protein. So for example, the messenger RNA sequence is read until the AUG codon is found. This signals the start and pulls in a tRNA molecule with the amino acid methionine, abbreviated MET. The tRNA drops off the methionine and then exits the ribosome complex as the strand gets shifted over to the next codon. The next codon reads UUA. The ribosome brings in a tRNA molecule that has an anticodon to match, which carries the amino acid leucine, abbreviated LEU. The leucine detaches from the tRNA molecule, and a peptide bond forms between the methionine that is already there for a primary protein chain that is now two amino acids long. The messenger RNA gets shifted again, and the next codon reads CAG. This codes for glutamine, GLN, which gets pulled in, detaches from the tRNA molecule, and then forms another peptide bond with the leucine. Now we have a primary protein structure of three amino acids. I think we get the picture here, and this process continues to happen until the ribosome reads a codon that signals signals for the process to stop, which is either UAA, UAG, or UGA. When the process stops, the long amino acid chain that was built leaves the ribosome and folds into a final structure to perform the function that it was built for. So the gist here, we took the messenger RNA sequence that was originally copied from the DNA and created a unique protein from it. The process of translation is complete. Now this idea of the central dogma and the sequence of DNA being used to inform decisions at the cellular level is not something that is unique to humans. In fact, almost every living thing that we know of uses the same genetic code, with the bases A, T, G, and C. It is the order and amount of bases that makes organisms unique. But with this knowledge of the structure of DNA and how it works, humans have been able to leverage this information and on large scales use it to our benefit. A great example of this is the use of the human insulin gene within bacteria. Insulin is an important protein within the human body that helps to regulate one's blood sugar. Some people, due to genetic mutations, cannot actively create insulin on their own. So what scientists do to make insulin is enlist bacteria cells to do the work. They take the insulin gene from a human cell, which is a section of DNA, and insert it into the genome of a bacteria cell via a plasmid. When the bacteria cells reproduce, they make copies of their DNA and plasmid DNA 
So if the insulin gene is there, they will copy it and pass it to their offspring asexually. With the gene present, the bacteria will start to create the insulin protein because they have the code to do so. Scientists let these bacteria colonies grow and produce insulin and later extract it to use for clinical purposes. So if you or someone you know is a type 1 diabetic, which means they cannot make their own insulin and have to instead inject insulin into their body to help regulate their blood sugar, odds are that the insulin that they are using was cultivated within bacteria that have the human gene to make it. Pretty cool.